The sun had begun to set, casting long shadows across the landscape as my friend and I embarked on our journey home. We were young, around 11 or 12, and didn't have cell phones yet. We had been out a little too late and thought my dad would be worried. So instead of taking the long way home, I wanted to take my usual shortcut through the woods. Although there was a path, the woods were very dark because of the summer leaves, and we were both nervous about walking through the woods so late. We hesitated. But I convinced us both that we would regret not going through the woods, the same way we might regret not going on a scary-looking amusement park ride that was actually a lot of fun. So on we marched into the woods with both our stomachs in knots. The forest was quiet and still. We moved quickly, wanting to get to the other side and out of the darkness as fast as we could. Then, after a short while, we heard crunching directly next to us that made us both stop. It had sounded a bit like footsteps on leaves, but it was also louder than that, almost like the crunching of an aluminum soda can. We were frozen there on the path with fear. The only things we had with us to light the way were iPods with glowing screens. I started to direct the light from my iPod toward the sound. My friend, knowing what I was about to do, said, Don't do it. Whatever was out there, she didn't want to see it. But I couldn't help myself. I shined my iPod down at the ground to my left, where we had heard the sound. What we saw still makes my stomach turn whenever I think of it. My iPod illuminated two legs covered in brown fur atop a pair of black shiny hooves. The fur was sort of reddish brown and mangy. I didn't shine the light up any higher, but I had the sense that this creature was at least six feet tall. We both instantly started running. We ran so fast all the way out of those woods that we could hardly breathe by the time we made it back to my father's house. From there, I don't even remember much of what happened besides talking to my dad, who was very worried. He said he had a bad feeling in his gut and had been about to come looking for us, which I had rarely ever heard him say as I was an independent type of kid and I often came back after dark. I'm not 100% sure if this qualifies under the fairy side of supernatural encounters, but the town my father lives in has these couple hours of the day, usually between 5pm to about 11, where things get really weird through the whole town. You can even feel the vibes aren't right. This isn't the only encounter me and that same friend have had around the same area, but it's the one that scares me the most. This happened in Minnesota. I personally feel like it was a fairy experience because with demons you would normally hear a bell beforehand and get very dizzy, where none of that happened. Fae can also typically be half horse, goat, or even just have hooved legs and are also well known to feed off energy. And we were already nervous going into the woods from earlier, either from the dark or intuition. I slightly regret not shining my light higher to see more than just the legs and feet of the creature, because then we would maybe have a better idea what we were looking at. But I'm also glad, because if it was really scary, one of us may have passed out and not been able to get out of there. My dad passed three years ago. This is his story more than mine, even though I was there. I was too young to remember any of it myself. I'm sharing it because my guidance counselor and mom recommended I do so, 
because my dad will never have the chance to tell anyone his stories, and I want to help him tell them, and maybe get closer with my dad in doing so. This happened in 2001 in Kansas. My dad was left to babysit me when his addiction wasn't as strong. He was always a fan of supernatural things and those alien documentaries. He was the sort of guy that would be fun to joke with, but if someone threatened his kid, he would rain all kinds of hell down on them. On that afternoon, he put me in my stroller, or what he called my Cadillac, to take me out for a walk to the nearby pond to feed the decks. He took me walking through the neighborhood down the left side of the road. As we were headed along, out of nowhere, these Victorian-looking people showed up, walking straight towards us. There were two of them, a man and a woman. They were very, very pale, as if the melanin in their skin was non-existent. And yet, they had the deepest, blackest eyes. They were dressed in Victorian-like clothing and seemed extremely out of place. My dad said that as soon as his eyes fell on them, it felt like time stopped. He froze in place. He felt like he couldn't move as these strangers approached. They came right up to us. The woman leaned over my stroller and said, What a cute baby. The man said, Baby. And then kept repeating the word over and over again. Baby, baby, baby. Then the man leaned over and started to unbuckle my stroller restraints. My dad, who up to this point had felt like he was in some sort of trance, snapped out of it, his instinct to protect me taking over. He grabbed me before the man could do anything and took off, racing away as fast as he could. He only slowed down when we got to the mailbox close to our house. Then he looked back, and the stroller was still there where he had left it, but it had been tipped over on the ground. The Victorian people were gone. My neighbor and his daughter, who had seen my dad running through the front window, came out to see what had happened. My dad was hysterical. There were tears rolling down his face. But he didn't want to talk about what had happened. He got me back in the house and called my mom's folks and went to lie down. From what I remember, my folks never reported the incident, and we never saw those Victorian people again. The weird thing is that out of nowhere at age four, I became convinced that I was adopted and that my real parents were out there somewhere searching for me. I would draw myself as a very pale, blonde-haired, and blue-eyed kid, which is nothing like what I look like. This feeling faded away in time. I found out later that my grandma on my mom's side burned my drawings, and now... Knowing the story of what happened that day, I don't blame her. Not one bit. This is the strangest thing that has ever happened to me. I had lived in this house for eight years in Colorado Springs, but the time had come to move on. I had developed a great appreciation for the two large trees about 20 yards in front of the house. I would hug them and sit by them, talk to them, meditate by them. I loved them so much. I thought of them as an old couple about 200 years old, one male and one female. I had set in motion everything about moving, selling the house and packing. There was a very large window looking out front from the living room. I was doing yoga on the living room floor and had just finished, was lying, looking up, out the window, upside down, staring at the big male tree. I said out loud to myself, Oh shoot, I forgot to tell the trees I'm leaving, and even thought I'll have to go visit them and do that today. 
in an instant, a large amount of brown objects came flying directly at me from the tree I was looking at, and they all hit the window right above my head. It was a loud clatter. It scared me slightly. It happened so fast. I couldn't tell what it was. It reminded me of a cross between birds or butterflies and dry brown leaves. This was in May and the trees were all green. There was no wind and the trees had tiny leaves anyway, not large enough to be the size of birds. I instantly got up and went outside to look around. There was nothing. No birds, no leaves anywhere. Nothing. It was jarring. And I immediately thought, fairies. I took it as the tree or tree spirits hearing me and saying goodbye. There were no marks on the window. It was loud enough that it could have been a handful of rocks getting thrown, hitting the window. It felt like such a short, fleeting encounter, but has left a big impression on me. I'm just so curious, what was that? Will I ever know? I've always looked for fairies out in nature and invited them to show themselves to me before listening to all your stories, but I don't recall them ever doing so, besides possibly that time and one other I'll outline next. One more tiny possible encounter. I've had this one one night in my new home in Austin, Texas. My two-year-old daughter and I were sitting on the porch during a rain and thunderstorm in summer. It was pouring heavy sheets of rain. It was beautiful. Then, all of a sudden, a small being that could have been an insect but didn't act or look like one flew into the cover of the porch area right above and by where we sat, looking down at us and flying in place for a few moments, facing us. There was a bright street light across the street, illuminating it. I pointed up and said to my daughter, Look, do you see the fairy? And she said, Yes. It fluttered for another moment in place and then disappeared into a shadow up high where a pillar held a tiny platform before holding up the roof on the porch. It was too high to get to for us to look further. I kept my eyes on the place I saw it go for a few minutes and saw nothing stir again. When I saw it for those few moments, I guess it was between two and three inches tall, with wings that were about the same size as its body, and very much like a typical shape you'd see if you Google fairy wings. It was so tiny and far away, uh, about four feet, with dim lighting that it was hard to make out any specific details, but the head shape and body kind of reminded me of a wasp, but with more humanoid legs. It felt like a fairy, and that's how I label it, but wonder if it was a sprite or something else, or just some insect. The rain was so intense, and the way it looked at us and hovered facing us made me feel like it wasn't an insect. Summer in the desert is a challenging time, with scorching heat that can be deadly. It's also a time of great joy, as it brings the much-needed rain. The transformation is dramatic. The sky changes from a dry, turquoise blue to one filled with sudden, powerful winds that can strip the roof off a house. Towering clouds, flashing with lightning, ride on these winds, surpassing even the tallest mountains. It's during this time that the human desert world interacts most vividly, with the magical sea Ania, also known as the flower world or fairy in English folklore. 
One unforgettable moment that encapsulates the joyful danger of the desert occurred when my husband and I got caught in a thunderstorm last year. In sweltering temperatures, we took a refreshing dip in the pool, only to be interrupted by the rain. Seeking shelter under a low roof, but exposed to the outside world, we witnessed a magnificent and terrifying spectacle. Lightning flashed, thunder boomed, and rain poured down in waves as every bush, cactus, mesquite tree in sight danced to the rhythm of the storm. One bolt struck perilously close to us. Amidst this display, I discovered something extraordinary. The rain children. Initially, they appeared as mere waves of rain, but as I continued to gaze, their forms became more distinct, and the more I stared, the more vivid they became. I saw children with heads and limbs and joyfully running feet. They scrambled down over the low stone wall of the patio, across the flags, up and over the wall on the other side, and then across the desert. There were thousands upon thousands of these water elementals, rejoicing in the act of giving life to all who need the rain the most, while the lightning struck and the thunder roared with glee. I'm sure most folk will tell me that I saw an optical illusion made more vivid with imagination. I cannot prove otherwise. Maybe what I saw, if you could freeze the moment in time and take a sampling, consisted purely of drops of water falling from the sky. Yet that doesn't change the reality of what I perceived as well. I only know that I saw the desert at its most dangerous and thrilling, beautiful and terrible. And that's where I think the fairies live. Approximately 18 months ago, a group of 25 friends and I went camping in the far north of Minnesota, in the Waters Canoe area. On our fourth day, we found a secluded island in one of the lakes, and decided to do some fishing and extended camping trip there. After much discussion of what we wanted to do for the fifth day, we decided to stay camped for the day and relax on the island. On the morning of the fifth day, we were all getting ready to go swimming and fishing, and a friend called the rest of us over to look at something he had found on the other side of the island. When we went to the other side of the island, we were all gobsmacked. We witnessed what I can only describe as gnomes. Short, human-looking beings with tall caps. We saw both male and female gnomes, as well as a few children. They were human-like, including facial features. Short, about 16 centimeters, not including their hats. With their hats, they were approximately 28 centimeters. They wore rough, homespun clothing of different colors. Their tall hats of various colors were blue, green, red, orange, purple. When speaking to one another, I would describe their language as a mixture of Swedish and Danish. One was playing something like a pan flute in this very rich and intoxicating melody that reminded me of a mixture of bird song and Celtic music. The gnomes were aware of us, as was obvious by the way they would occasionally shoot us the evil eye, but they made no malicious moves or threatening moves towards us. We sat there and watched the entire village for about 95 minutes or so before we left to go about our activities. We camped out on the island again that night and were not disturbed by them. I went back near where their village was early the next morning and left a gift of a gold ring that was supposed to be given to my deceased fiancé. I think it's what she would have wanted. I remember reading about gnomes as a child. My grandma had a book about gnomes, and they were identical to what was described in the book. I'm an airline pilot, and prior to that, a private investigator. 
So discussing something like this could potentially ground me and potentially call my prior work into question. So I would like to remain anonymous. I grew up on an Oklahoma Native American reservation. I was told many tales of the little people. I know they are known by many names, the Fae being but one. In the heart of the reservation, amidst towering trees, stood my grandmother's house. Its weathered walls held generations of wisdom. Not far away, down a winding stone trail, lay the dwelling of my great-grandmother, a wise and enigmatic soul. And beyond her house, a short distance through the forest, a creek flowed with crystal-clear waters. It was raining that day, a small thunderstorm, but the kind that lasts all day. I can remember hearing the low rumble of thunder every now and then, and I did so love the rain. And it was summertime, so it felt good to be outside. I decided to go exploring. I was around four or five at this time. My great-grandmother had warned me before about the little people. She spoke of their presence and the importance of showing them respect. Throughout the woods near her house, she would leave small offerings, marked sticks, miniature tables with chairs, and delectable treats. These were not toys, she had warned, but sacred objects to be revered. Yet on that particular day, an invisible force tugged at my curious spirit. I felt an urge to wander beyond my grandmother's porch, past the familiar paths and towards the melody of the creek. As I roamed through the woods, raindrops glistening on leaves, I caught sight of a flicker of light, and I began to follow what I thought was a firefly about the woods and all around the rocky bank of the creek. It danced before me, playful and mischievous, at times, it seemed as though I could hear it giggling. But soon after, I saw something else. Something not playful or ethereal at all. A figure seemed to emerge from the shadows. A creature with a blackened head, its face twisted into a malevolent scowl. He was moving towards me, quickly. My instincts told me to run, that this creature meant me harm, but I couldn't move. Then, when it was only a few strides away from reaching me, the firefly positioned itself between me and the creature. The firefly's glow intensified, casting a brilliant radiance that engulfed everything in sight. In that blinding light, the darkness dissolved. And suddenly, as if time had folded upon itself, I stood once again on my great-grandmother's porch. She sat in her old rocking chair, calm, calmly cleaning vegetables harvested from her garden. I was completely confused. But before I could say anything, my parents came rushing down the trail, their panic voices calling my name. Apparently, I had been missing for hours. They swooped me up. My great-granny was calm and acted like nothing had happened. But as my parents and I were leaving, I recall seeing a little table on my great-granny's porch. One of its little chairs was pulled away from the table, as if somebody had been sitting in it. And there was food on the plate, on that table, that had been mostly eaten. My great-granny would only tell me not to ask questions and show the little people my respect when I would bring it up, but never would say any more. Thanks for watching. Just a quick announcement about my upcoming novel, The Ghosts of Nothing. I have a tentative release date of July 18th for those interested in picking up a copy and it should be available for pre-order sometime in the next couple of weeks. I'll be releasing a trailer for the book soon here on the channel, 
and I'm just really excited about it. It's a fantasy about a girl who lives in a small town called Nothing. The town is famously haunted, but as she will soon discover, fairies might actually have more to do with this town's troubles than ghosts. So far, I've been getting a lot of really positive feedback on the book, which I just really appreciate. I had so much fun writing it and just delving into the fairy world and imagining what it might be like based on my knowledge of fairy folklore and just my intuition and imagination. So I think if you like fairies, if you're interested in fairy folklore, this is likely a book you will enjoy. So I hope you will pick up a copy. It's going to be available in either ebook, paperback, or hardcover format. I am trying to create an audio version of the book, um, but I'm not sure when that will be available. It's proving to be more complicated than I originally thought, so it's, it's taking some extra time for me to work it out. But um, if you would like to get a book, one of the books that come out in July, um, just to support the channel, I would really appreciate that as well. <laughs> um, but I understand if you want to wait for the audio, I'm just, I'm not sure I can give you guys a firm date right now on that one. So, um, but there will be an ebook. Um, so hopefully you will pick up that one if you're interested in reading it. Um, and that's it for the announcement. Um, I'm really excited about it. I, I just, I hope you guys are excited too. <laughs> As usual, I'd like to thank everyone for watching and to all the subscribers who submitted their stories for this one. If you have a story to share, you can check out my website at scaryfairygodmother.com, link in the description. It ha has a spot where you can submit your stories, comments, questions, or suggestions. You can also sign up for my mailing list there, Fairy Lights. As always, special thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon and to anyone who joined the channel made a one-time donation through PayPal or Coffee, or who clicked the super thanks button. I really appreciate you guys so much and the support you are giving this work. If you like this content and would like to support it, please check out my Patreon page and the other support options in the description below. The stories in this video came courtesy of subscribers and the fairy census, so thanks to everyone who submitted. Just a quick reminder, if you have a true fairy encounter story, please share it with the Fairy Investigation Society. They are conducting a new fairy census, link in the description, and the deadline for that is fast approaching. So please do participate in this exciting project, which will help us all learn more about the phenomenon of fairy encounters. If you've already submitted your story to me, and don't want to rewrite it for the census but still want to participate, then just send me an email or write me a message on my website that you would like me to forward your story to the Fairy Investigation Society, and I will do so, but I do need your permission to do that. The stories in this video were edited for dramatic and narration reasons. Please leave a comment below, like, share, and subscribe if you're new. It really helps the channel when you do that, and hit the bell to receive notifications of new videos. And until next time, this has been a visit from your scary fairy godmother. <laughs>